Okay. So, uh, can anyone can everyone see the screen? Can everyone see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, good. So, welcome to the second week of senior stream. So. Um, so today we'll be uh, doing a couple things. Um, first of all, uh, there was a poll sent out last week about the pace of the class, and I think the consensus was that the class was a bit fast. So uh, I'm going to try to uh, kind of give a rough uh, estimate of uh, how much each uh, topic will take us, and uh, I'll try to have a quick pause in between every concept so you can formulate your questions. and. Um, as always, if you have any questions uh, you, uh, about anything that we talked about, you can always ask and you can also uh, remind me to slow down and explain stuff again if you uh, feel like the explanation uh, wasn't uh, good enough for you to understand. And uh, so first, uh, we are going to uh, take up the contest, but first I do want to talk about uh, time and sp space complexity first um, so that the solution of the solutions of the contest, we can analyze the algorithms and their complexity. So uh, a big part of uh, analyzing algorithms is trying to see how much time your uh, approximately your algorithm will take and also how much space it's going to take up. So how much resources is your program uh, going to take up while solving this problem? So why do we calculate time complexity? Well, in every programming problem, there is a limit of how long your program is allowed to execute um, for each test case. And so if the time limit is exceeded, then your solution is too slow and you're going to receive the time limit exceeded verdict. So for example, um, uh, let me just open up a random DMUCH problem. Wow, that is slow. Okay, so if I just open up a random problem, you can see on the right here, um, it says time limit and memory limit. So if you exceed this time limit, uh, what's gonna happen is you can see all the status codes uh, in, in this page here, and it'll say time TLE, time limit exceeded. Your program took too long to execute. So if your program takes uh, exceeds this limit, it's gonna give you the TLE, um, uh, verdict instead of the AC verdict, which is what you want. And so when we think of solution to a problem, we want to try to estimate the amount of operations we'll be, we'll be doing in our program and compare that to the time limit to predict whether it can fit below the limit. And so this is why reading constraints on the problem is very important. So if you know how to calculate time complexity, you'll be able to tell whether a solution can work before you waste time implementing your solution. And it can also hint towards the intended time complexity. Um, and therefore hint towards the intended solution. So for this problem, uh, it doesn't really have a formal constraint. Most, most problems that are a bit uh, more challenging do have constraints. And this just says a positive integer less than 100. So I guess this would be a constraint for this problem. Uh, in our contest problems, you'll be able to see the constraints a bit more clearly. So uh, how do we uh, represent time complexity? So the amount of operations that have to be done most often depends on the input size. So we want to describe the complexity of the program as a function of the input size. And by input size, is, I mean, for example, um, if I were to give you an array of length three and tell you to uh, give me the sum of all the elements in the array, then you would loop through three elements and you would give me the sum, right? But if I were to give you, um, say, the, the array's length would be a, a thousand, then you have to you would have to loop through a thousand elements to give me the sum. And so the input size of the first one would be three, and the second one would be a thousand. And so you can see how the speed of our program would depend on the in input size. And so since the exact number of um, operations as the input size grows larger can be hard to determine. We only want to observe the approximate behavior of the function as the input size increases. So when we're expressing time complexity uh, of a program, uh, we're going to ignore constant factors and only consider the most time consuming parts of the program. 
And uh, this is something that we're going to uh, talk about in more detail as we actually calculate the time complexity. So um, uh, don't worry if you don't know what that means yet. And um, we express time complexity in big O notation. So if the input size is n, I should um, I should capitalize this to avoid confusion, actually. and we need to do f at n equals n squared operations in our program, then we express our time complexity as O of n squared. And so usually big O notation represents the worst case complexity, so uh, even if there might be a case where your program won't actually uh, take n squared operations to terminate, um, you, will st you would still represent the worst case, which uh, in some programs might be n squared and might be o of n and we'll see more examples uh, at the bottom there and so you can visualize the different uh, time complexities with a graphing calculator like desmos so um, i'm just waiting for this to load Okay, so say we had um, f at n equal f at x equals x. Um, that would be a linear time complexity, and so it, it would graph this line. And um, let's say x was the input size, and y is the amount of operations we have to do. You can see that uh, this would be a line here. But if x was f of x is x squared, then you can see that that's going to grow much uh, much quicker, but uh, there are also time complexities like f at x equals uh, log x, and that's going to grow much slower like that. Um, you can also put f at x equals square root of x, uh, and so on, and that's going to grow uh, a bit faster than uh, log x, but a bit slower than uh, linear, and so on, and you can vi kind of visualize how, um, how your operations is going to increase as the input size increases. And the idea of co time complexity is the, the worse your time complexity is, the slower your solution will run as the input size increases arbitrarily. And what I mean by that is, um, for example, an n squared solution will always outgrow an O of n solution uh, regardless of the constant factor. So for example, let, let me get rid of these two to eliminate confusion. So um, you would see uh, uh, this is the f at x equals x, and this is f at x equals x squared. But what if I put 10x here? Then you you would think, hey, th this um, this 10 actually made this f at x. Um, it seems like this is actually growing much faster than this. But um, eventually, x squared is going to outgrow 10x at, at some point. And in this case, it's here. And so here's where x squared is going to take over and still grow faster as the input size increases. So are there any questions about that? I'll assume no. OK, so how do we actually calculate the time complexity of a program? So I want to show some examples of uh, operations that would uh, have different time complexity. So um, all of our basic operations would be O of one. So one plus one, that would be, that would have, that would have O of one time complexity and anything like one times one, one times two or like 10 times seven or a division. Those are all gonna have um, O of one time complexity. Um, but except they still don't have the exact same uh, constant factor. For example, um, division is much slower than addition uh, in C++. Um, so they won't necessarily run the same, run at the same speed, but at least they have the same time complexity. So misleading operations. So s string comparisons. So if you wanted to compare two strings like A equals ABC, and b equals something else, and uh, and you were to compare a with b, this would not actually be o of one. This would be uh, actually linear with respect to 
uh, the length of the strings. And um, also, if you pass in a vector, uh, never mind, I won't talk about that right now. And so let's talk about some uh, O of n uh, operations. So the most basic one we know is um, if we were to have uh, a variable n, and we want our loop from, let's say, uh, 0 to n minus 1. Oh, whoops. And then we have constant time code here. Uh, by constant time, I mean O of 1. Then this entire program would have uh, O of n time complexity because the amount of operations we do depends on n. And um, the number of operations is going to scale uh, linearly. Uh, so an example of O of n squared would be uh, very similar, except uh, if you loop another loop inside here. So for example, uh, let's loop j from 0 to n. Now this is going to give us uh, an n squared program. So you can see for, for every i, um, it's going to loop through j, uh, from, loop j from 0 to n minus 1. So that's n operations for every single i, and you have n i, so n times n is n squared. And n cubed, same idea. Um, you would just have another loop nested in here. So the number of nested loops is oftentimes uh, a good indicator of the time complexity uh, of your program. And so let's say we had another variable m. Um, And we were to loop from j from j 0 to m minus 1. And we put constant time code here. Then uh, what the co time complexity of this would be n times n. Because for every i, and we have n i's, we're, we're going to do m operations. So n times m, m sorry, n times m would be... Uh, O of nm uh, time complexity. So uh, you can calculate the time complexity with nested loops in a lot of uh, situations. And finally, uh, if we have sorting, so if we had an array um, of length n and we sorted the array, it would be O of n log n. So uh, should I demonstrate that? Sure. So if we had an array of length, uh, I don't know, 100, and then uh, we took an input into the array, oh. and then we sorted the array. Like that. Then this sort function is actually going to have O of n log n um, time complexity. Now, um, if you want to find out why this is uh, O of n log n, I encourage you to uh, go do the research on that, but uh, I'm not going to get into sorting algorithms today. Um, so how can we tell whether a solution of a certain time complexity will fit under the time limit? So when we're calculating whether a solution will fit, um, you can assume that C++ runs at about uh, 10 to the 8 operations per second. And there's a chart here um, where you can see conserv conservative upper bounds of n for each time complexity. So um, this is actually a pretty helpful book. I encourage you to read the rest of it. But today we're going to be fo uh, focused on time complexity, this chart here. So um, it says uh, if your time complexity, sorry, if the constraints on n um, are less than or uh, equal to 10, then uh, your time complexity has to be, uh, well, it doesn't have to be, but it would be conservative to have a solution that's O of n, n factorial or O of n to the 7 or O of n to the 6 or you can obviously also have uh, better time complexities. So how this works is uh, if n goes up to 5 times 10 to the 5 then uh, they're saying that an O of n log n solution would pass and uh, an O of n root n solution would maybe pass but um, it would be it would depend on your constant factor at that point. Um, but obviously, if O of n log n can pass, 
then a better time complexity like O of n or O of square root log n or O of uh, square root n, uh, they should pass as well. Now, as I talked about here, um, even though we don't express constant factors and overhead in big O notation, uh, they should still be considered, especially if the time limit is tight. So just because the time, time complexity uh, is better doesn't mean that the, your program will necessarily run faster within the given constraints. And that seems like a contradiction to what I said before, which is um, the worse time, your time complexity is, the slower that your solution will run. But that's if the input size increases, um, or let's say uh, grows without bound. And so in programming competitions and the problems in uh, the programming contests, your constraints are never going to grow without bound, right? You're always going to have uh, your integers or your input size bound by a certain constraint. And so that's why constant factor is still very important to our calculations. And so, for, for example, an, uh, an O of n squared solution could run faster than an O of n solution um, if it never gets to outgrow this, the O of n solution on that graph that I showed earlier. Okay, and you'll get better at calculating time complexity uh, the more you do it. So um, if you're kind of unsure how to do that, we're going to go through a couple programs today and we're going to analyze their time complexity. Okay, space complexity and uh, is kind of similar and the argument for calculating it is also similar. If your program takes up too much memory, uh, you're going to receive the memory limit exceeded verdict uh, or in, in some cases segmentation fault. If you, uh, I believe if you allocate the memory at compile time, uh, you, you might get segmentation fault instead. And so similarly, uh, space complexity can also be expressed in big O notation. So if I had an array of length n, um, it would take up O of n memory. If I had a 2D uh, array of length n in each dimension, it would take up n squared memory. And 2D array of size n in one dimension and size m in the other dimension, uh, that would give me O of n m uh, memory complexity or space complexity, sorry. Um, however, with uh, arrays, uh, in, if, we're, if we're dealing with fixed size arrays, we can actually directly calculate the amount of memory that our arrays will take up. And so how we do this is, first of all, we have to know how, much our data, how many bytes of memory that our data will take up. So for example, if we had an integer, uh, that would be four bytes, uh, usually on our compilers. Um, and one byte is 8 bits, which makes sense because we're dealing with 32-bit integers. So long longs would be 8 bytes, uh, characters would be uh, one byte, etc., etc. Um, and some examples of um, different uh, memory allocations, and I'm just going to show that here. So, oh, whoops. So if I declared an integer a, um, then I would assume that this would take up four bytes, right? Because an integer should be four bytes, and we can confirm that in C++ with the size of function. So I said C of size of a. Hopefully that should give me four. Okay, and uh, we can go through the other ones as well. So actually, I'll just copy them into my code. Oh, I actually... Hmm. Okay, I'll copy this one here. So let's get rid of those actually okay and we can calculate the space sorry the amount of memory that this will take up uh, by just multiplying how, how much or the number of bytes that each data type uh, each element of this data type takes up and then multiply that by the number of elements we have so in this case uh, long longs would ha take up eight bytes per element and this would have uh, 10 to the power of 7. So 
this would have a this will take up 10 to the 7 times 8 uh, bytes. So we can confirm that by just calling CL size of array. Okay, and yes, it did return uh, 8 times uh, 10 to the 7. And you can calculate the amount of memory your arrays are taking up just like that. And uh, the default memory limit on the CCC is 256 megabytes. Oh, I should talk about like bytes to megabytes. So uh, actually, if you just Google it, it should be uh, pretty easy to uh, see how, how many megabytes are in a byte. Or you, So it, uh, 8 times 10 to the 7 bytes would be 80 me megabytes. And you can just convert them um, eventually. Uh, you might be just be able to tell like uh, whether something will fit in uh, fit into memory like that and uh, that's about it for space complexity I believe so um, does anyone have any questions about calculating uh, the amount of memories that uh, the amount of memory that your arrays take up or a space complexity or a time complexity or any of that Uh, okay, so if you have any questions at any point, you can always ask. Uh, for, for now, I'm just going to move on to the contest takeup. So um, let me open stuff up. So let's just go through the problems of the contest one by one. Um, so. Senior problem one is smart cheating. I'll read the statement out. So Evan is struggling in class, so he's considering cheating off of his classmates. However, we all know that there are severe consequences if you get caught cheating. This leaves Evan no choice but to not get caught. So the secret is make, not making it too obvious. So Evan wants to cheat off of the person with the second highest mark. Given N marks, so A1, A2, A3 to AN, find out what that mark is. So to summarize, we want to find the second highest uh, element in the array, uh, and it has to be strictly second highest. So um, you can see our input size is n, and n goes up to 10 to the 6, and this is the constraint that I was talking about. And so that, and that tells us the number of marks that we have to consider. And then on the next line, uh, we have uh, n integers, uh, a1, a2, a3 to an. And so these uh, numbers go go from 0 to 10 to the 9 inclusive, and these are the marks that uh, need to be considered. So uh, you can tell that uh, it has to be the strictly second highest, and it can't be tied with the highest uh, by just reading the output specification here. Uh, if there are no marks that are strictly smaller than the highest mark, then you output negative 1. And so you can see from the sample here, um, if all three numbers are 5, then there is no second highest element, then you would output negative 1. And for this sample, uh, you have 7, 3, 0, 2. So th obviously 3 is smaller than 7, but greater than everything else, then our answer would be 3. And so um, what we can do here is just uh, create a somewhat simple algorithm. So uh, in our, f we're going to keep track of um, two variables. So uh, we're going to keep track. Of, well, obviously, we're going to keep track of uh, n, which is the um, si the size of our input, and also we're going to have an array a that stores the the marks. Um, but also, we're going to keep track of the largest element in the array, and then we're also going to keep track of the answer, which would be the second highest. So as we take an input here. Let's just say for every mark, um, largest equals the maximum between largest and a of i, and so that would that should give us um, the largest element in the array stored in largest here. And so what we can do now is we can loop through all the numbers again, and we say if this element is strictly smaller than the largest element, then let's take let's update our answer to be um, the maximum between the answer uh, and this element. So in other words, 
If this element is strictly smaller than the largest element and this element is greater than the answer, then let's make answer that element. And that'll either one give us um, the answer as the second highest element, or if everything uh, that we found in our array was did not satisfy this condition, then it'll stay as negative one and that's what we're going to output. So is this algorithm clear to everyone? Okay, so uh, if this is clear, then uh, we're going to move on to the second problem. And if, if you do uh, have a question uh, at any point uh, about any of the earlier problems, you can just always ask. Um, so the second um, problem says Evan needs volunteer hours. However, there's one issue. He's too lazy to earn them himself. So instead, he recruits volunteers to do the work for him. So there are n events that Evan wants to volunteer uh, wants volunteer hours from, and each event i runs from day x i to day y i inclusive, and Evan needs at least one volunteer hour. Uh, uh, sorry, Evan needs at least one volunteer to attend each event every day that it runs. Each of his volunteers can show up to at most one event per day. What is the minimum number of volunteers that Evan needs to recruit? So um, the problem statement at first, uh, you might have to read it a couple times to understand what it's saying. But um, essentially, we can rephrase the problem as, OK, there are n events, uh, each starting, uh, starting and ending at some point. And uh, you need to recruit volunteers. And uh, by the way, all these uh, solution files will be posted on GitHub and we'll uh, share the GitHub link with you guys so you can uh, go look at the solutions uh, at any time that you want. And also there is a mirror that is up on the judge. So you just select the contest, uh, M contest zero. Oh, Yasha is asking for you to go through question one quick again. Oh, sure. So, um, do you understand the problem that we need to find the second uh, highest element in the array? Why does it say in 32 t main? Oh, don't worry about that. Uh, that's just actually the same as in main, except, um, yeah, that, that would be the same as in main. Um, so I'll, I'll just go through this algorithm again, assuming that you uh, understand the problem. So first, uh, we're going to initialize an array uh, A, and we're going to let it just A at I store the mark at index I. And we're going to make that size uh, 10 to the 6, because the problem says um, the maximum number of marks that uh, they'll give us is 10 to the 6. So we don't need an array that's greater than 10 to the 6. 10 to the 6 will do fine. And so first, let's just initialize uh, n and then, sorry, let's declare n and then take that take n in as the input. So that'll be the number of marks we need to consider. And then uh, after that, let's initialize uh, two variables. So largest will store the largest element in the array and answer will store the second highest element in the array. And if it's not touched, then it stays as negative one. So first I'm going to uh, take an input uh, into my array. And also I'm gonna let largest be the maximum between largest and this element. So what this is saying essentially is if this element is greater than largest, then this the largest will be replaced with this. So largest will become the largest element uh, in the array. Or sorry, largest will store the largest element in the array. And in the second for loop, what we're saying is um, for every mark, um, if the mark is smaller than, strictly smaller than largest, then we're going to take the answer as the maximum between answer and the mark because the answer is going to store the second largest element in the array. And then finally, um, we're, we're just going to output answer. And um, if none of the marks satisfy this condition, then answer would stay as negative one, which is exactly what we want to output if there's no element strictly smaller than the highest element. Is that clear? Oh, uh, okay. 
Okay. Uh, if there are no further questions on this, then I'll explain problem two. Uh, what was I talking about? Oh, I was uh, rephrasing the problem. So n events each starting and ending at some point. Uh, well, at some point I should say on some day. And then we need to recruit uh, volunteers to attend them. Now the thing is, um, the important part is uh, Evan needs at least one volunteer to attend each event every day that it runs and that each of his volunteers can show up to at most one event per day. And so let's just take the second sample and put as an example. So, um, hmm. if we had um, day one, day two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ooh. And so this says there's an event going from day one to four, right? And there's an event going from days five to six, and there's an event going from days one to seven. Now, if he only recruits one volunteer, then um, they'll be able to go to this event. But on the same t at the same time, they would want to attend this event because Evan needs a volunteer there. So one volunteer wouldn't work. So you would need two volunteers because there are uh, two events going on at the same time. So essentially what the question is actually uh, asking is um, how many uh, events are occurring on uh, in one day uh, at max? So for example, if we had another event that went here from days four to six, what happened is um, these two volunteers on day four would have to, um, att this volunteer would have to attend this event, this volunteer would have to attend this event, and we would have no, have no one to attend this event. So we would need a vol another volunteer here to uh, attend this. So uh, on any given day. Oh, I, th I, actually, I actually already said that. This is actually not even, this is not well worded. Let's just say, um, how should I word this? Uh, what is the maximum number of events occurring on any given day? So what we're going to do is we're going to say, um, we're going to let events at i store the number of events on day i. Um, so uh, n is again going to be our in input. So um, we're going to take an in input from n and uh, oh, I should mention that I can I only need events to go up to 10 e6, sorry, 10 to the power of 6. Um, because it says um, it, the days that it'll end on will always not exceed uh, 10 to the 6. And so n goes up to 10 to the 5, I should also mention. And the distance between um, x and y is no greater than uh, 9. <coughs> Sorry. So um, first we're going to take an input again, and then... Um, we're going to uh, loop th from 0 to n minus 1 because we want to take in n events. So let's just name variables x and y, and we're going to take in those as input. And that would be the input format. So this would be n, this would be x, this would be y. And then for every uh, iteration, we would take in x and y like that. And so what we're going to do is we're going to loop from x to y. So from day x to day y. We're just going to add one to events at j, if j is the day. So because our events at i stores the number of events on day i, then um, 
we're, every time we have an event uh, occurring from day X to Y, we're just going to add one to events at J for all J um, that is greater than or equal to X and smaller than or equal to Y. So now what we'll do is we'll keep an answer a variable zero, uh, initialized to zero, and um, for every uh, day, we're just going to loop through every possible day. And we're going to say um, if that <coughs> if events at i is greater than answer, we're going to store that in answer. And so that'll give us the maximum amount of events uh, on occurring on every, any given day. So are there any questions on this? So if this is clear, uh, I'm going to move on to the third problem. So this is a rather long statement, but um, I'll clarify everything at the end. Um, so Gordon is eating his favorite chocolate bar. Since it's such qual high quality chocolate, he has to savor every square. The chocolate bar is m by n squares. He can break along and break the chocolate along vertical and horizontal lines as shown in the image. So this would be a vertical line. This would be a horizontal line like that. A single break of a part of the chocolate along a chosen vertical or horizontal line divides that part into two smaller ones. Each break along one of the lines costs energy expressed by a positive integer. Note that this cost does not depend on the size of the part that is being broken, but rather the line the break goes along. The cost of breaking along vertical lines is x1, x2, all the way to x m minus 1, as you can see, so this is so all the uh, vertical lines uh, are labeled by x. So this would be x1, x2, x3. It might be a bit small. I'll make that bigger like that. And along the horizontal lines is uh, y1, y2, uh, etc. <coughs> so the cost of breaking the whole bar into single squares is the sum of the cost of all the breaks. Gordon hires you to find out the minimum amount of energy required to break the entire bar into individual squares for him to savor. So I want to I want to clarify how breaking the bar works. So um, I realized that during the contest that this wasn't perfectly clear. But um, let's say you had a bar that was a two by two piece of chocolate, and you can break it along this line or this line. Now, if you broke it horizontally like that, what would happen is you would get a piece of one by two like that, and you would get a piece like this, right? So that's one break, but now each time you have to, you now want to break along this line, right? Now, if you break this into two parts, that would be two individual squares, and that's another break. And if the same thing here, you want to break that into individual parts along the same line, that's actually another break. So it would take a total of three breaks to break um, a two by two into individual squares like that. Okay, so um, the intuition here is that um, we want to break along the expensive lines as little as possible. And every time, um, as I showed you, um, okay, so every time you break along a horizontal line, um, you're going to separate the piece of chocolate into two pieces. So when you want to go and make a vertical break again, you're going to have to make two breaks um, along, the, along the line because you have two pieces of chocolate. So the number of breaks along a line we must perform is equal to the number of perpendicular breaks that have been done already. And so, for example, um, I think I said this already, but if you break the initial chocolate bar horizontally once, the next time you make a vertical break, you're going to need to perform two breaks along the vertical line. I'll add that. So therefore, it's reasonable for us to assume that uh, we should greedily break along the lines that are most expensive in terms of cost to least, least expensive. So the solution here is we want to sort the lines in non-increasing order by cost. And what non-increasing means is that it's um, decreasing except uh, these adjacent elements can be equal. So it's not necessarily strictly decreasing, it's just not, not increasing. 
and we're going to keep track of the number of horizontal and vertical breaks that have already been performed and um, <clears throat> we're going to loop through the lines and um, we're going to uh, add the cost times the number of perpendicular breaks uh, plus one uh, to our total and then we're going to add the number of breaks uh, in this direction sorry we're going to add to the number of breaks in this direction um, so uh, here's the code for the solution descri described so uh, we're going to take an input uh, of n and m and we're going to loop from 0 to m minus 2 because um, we have n we have uh, m minus one space separated integers that we want to take in. Mm. And so um, what we'll just take in the cost of this line. And um, since the first m minus one space separated integers are the, um, the breaks along the vertical lines, let's just denote that by putting a zero in the second part of the pair. And similarly, for the next uh, n minus 1 lines, we're going to put a 1 on the second part of the pair. To, so 0 represents vertical, and 1 represents horizontal. And that's just how we're going to differentiate between them. So um, when we're sorting uh, pairs, what's going to happen is it's going to compare the first uh, element in the pair and then the second element in the pair. So now that we have them all in one array, uh, we can sort them. And then we can uh, sort them in reverse order just like that. So this greater pair in n is uh, one of the default uh, sorting uh, structs that you can use to sort them in reverse. OK, so now we're going to keep track of three variables again. Um, H would be uh, the number of horizontal breaks plus 1. And V would be the number of vertical breaks that have already been performed plus 1. And answer is our total cost. So now for every single line in our array, uh, what we're going to say is uh, if the second element is 0, so if it's a vertical line, then we're going to say um, we're going to add h times the, uh, the cost of this break. So h is the number of horizontal breaks that we've already done. And we're going to add to the number of vertical breaks. And symmetrically, uh, we're going to check uh, otherwise, if it's uh, one, which means it's horizontal, uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna add to our answer uh, the number of vertical breaks that have already been performed plus one times um, the cost of this break, and we're gonna add to the number of horizontal breaks, and finally we can just output the answer. So that is the solution to problem three. Are there any questions? Oh, I did say there was an alternate solution. So um, another solution that was possible was that um, you can see that you need to break along each of the lines at least once. Now, depending on the order that you break, you might have to break along some, some of the lines t uh, twice or three times and so on. So at each intersection, uh, essentially what you can simulate is that whether I'm going to let this line pass through first or this line pass through. So what you can also do is go through each intersection and choose the minimum cost and add it to our total and also add uh, the cost of all the lines to our total and that would also give us the correct uh, answer. So are there any uh, questions regarding uh, problem three on the contest? Oh, I'd just like to say before we continue, uh, if you're like new to C++ and like not very familiar with primitive programming, uh, we didn't expect you to get like many of the harder questions. Yes, that is very true. So um, this contest uh, was mainly just to, uh, for you to uh, get familiar with the platform. Uh, if you could solve a problem, uh, that that's great. And if you couldn't, that's also fine. Uh, because we're going to do a, a lot more practice throughout the year and every other contest uh, that we're going to be doing this year um, it'll be different from this contest in the sense of uh, we'll only make problems that um, from now on we're only going to make problems that you that don't require any knowledge uh, that you don't know that was a very confusing sense um, in other words we're going to make problems that you have the knowledge to solve
Okay, um, problem four. Participants of a, a programming contest often assume that the problems are ordered in increasing difficulty um, and to confuse and consensus, confuse the contestants, Raiden wants you to order n problems in a particular order. However, you're only allowed to reorder problems by swapping the position of any two problems. What is the minim minimum amount of swaps needed to reorder the problems from its initial order to his desired order? So on the first line we have n, again n going up to 10 to the 6. And this is the number of problems, and so therefore the length of our array. And the second line we have a permutation of n, and so that will be our initial order. And on the third line we're going to have um, another permutation, which is the desired order of the problems. So um, we can look at our samples here to better understand our problem. So we want to reorder this such that it becomes this sequence, except we can only swap the position of any two uh, problems. Or uh, in, whoops, what have I done? Oh, I guess that just scrolls up. Okay, uh, as I was saying, um, we want to swap this uh, into this order except we can only swap the position of two elements. So let's just try simulating um, a swap. So if I try to draw, so one uh, wants to go here. So let's draw a loop from one to one. Sorry, let's draw a, an edge from one to one. So if we swap one and four, now it's gonna take the spot of four. Now, now we wanna know where four wants to go. So four actually also wants to go to where one was. So we're, we can draw an edge from four to one. Now what happened here was that um, and within one swap, one went to four and four went to one. And so that would be, we have two edges here, but that would only take one swap, right? Now uh, we have two, five, three, th these are not swapped yet. So let's see where two wants to go. So two uh, in its desired order wants to go here. Let's draw an edge from two to two like that. And uh, the element that was here was three. Now three actually wants to go uh, in the middle here. And in the middle we have five. Five actually wants to go to where two was. So it's kind of like two wants to go to three. Now three wants to go to five. And five wants to go where two is. Now we can see, and uh, for the other one, it would be one wants to go where four was and four wants to go where one was. And if you test out the other example, you would get something very similar, for example, um, like that. And four goes to four, and then six goes to six. Um, and then this seven would go to seven, and then this five would go to five, uh, back like that. And this two would just go to itself. So, I can, you can you can draw it out like that and every time you're gonna notice that you're you're just gonna form cycles between these numbers and what's happening here is that every number has exactly uh, one position that it wants to go to and every number has exact has, has exactly one number that wants to take its position and in the case of two here two wants to go to where it was and two the number that wants to go into its position is itself and so that's kind of a special case where um, it doesn't have to be swapped with anything. It's already in order. And so we notice that the number of times we have to swap these elements to, um, so for example, uh, in the sequence 2, 5, 3, which was a subsequence of that, the number of swaps, swaps we have to do is actually um, 2. So um, if we want it to be the, in the order of 5, 3, 2, um, what we can do is let's swap two and three if we were to actually simulate the swaps and then we can sw swap five and three. And so we can see that um, that's one swap and that's two swaps and we get our right answer. And the intuition goes something like every time uh, you swap an element, you put an element into its desired order but the last swap you don't have to do because if n minus one, if you have n positions and you and um, and you have n numbers uh, and you have n numbers, uh, this is a very poor drawing. Ignore this. Let's just say numbers like that. 
Um, and you know that uh, if n minus 1 numbers are in place, then the last number uh, is always still in place because there's no other position that it can be in. So the answer and for each cycle ends up being the length of the cycle uh, minus 1. So for this one, um, it, it would take two swaps. For this one, it would take one swap because 2 minus 1 is 1. Uh, for the self loop, the length is 1 minus 1. This would take zero swaps, and that makes sense because it doesn't need to move. And uh, that that will be our uh, general solution to the problem. So let's just let um, a at i store the number at uh, index i in the initial order. And let's let next at i store... Uh, it should put NXT because uh, I think if you put next, it uh, might not let you because it's conflicting with a variable name. And uh, let next at i store the index of the number i um, in the desired order. And so let uh, vis at i store whether the index has been visited. And um, for each cycle, um, we're just going to, what you can do is you can find the length and then um, you can see that the number of swaps would uh, that would sort the cycle would be length minus one as we described or you can say okay so we need to find every cycle and take its length and we know the sum of all the lengths is n so what we can actually do is say we start out with n and then we subtract one every time we find a cycle because we have length minus one every time uh, we have a cycle right so it's the same as uh, it's the same logic. So if if you have n starting out, you just subtract the number of cycles uh, that are in this um, in the array. So first we're just going to take an input uh, of n, and then we're going to take in the a of i, which is the the number at the index i. And so now, uh, on the, in the second for loop, uh, we're going to take in the number a, but then we're going to say uh, next at a equals i, because next stores the index of the number i uh, in, the desired, in the desired order. So the second permutation, the second permutation here would be the order that we want, right? So um, if this was 3, um, then we know that um, the number 3 wants to go at position i. So uh, with how that's going to be useful is um, the first array, the 3 is here. And using the next array, I can, I can tell what index uh, this 3 wants to go to. The, the index would be this. So 3 would want to go to position 0 uh, if you were at 0 indexing your arrays. So uh, as we said, we're going to uh, start out with answer being n, and then uh, we're going to loop through n. So we're going to loop through each index in the array. And um, if the uh, index is already visited, that means it's already been uh, repositioned. Well, we're not actually repositioning the elements. We're just uh, checking for the length of the cycle now. So if it's already visited, uh, then we ignore that. So what continue does is that it reads, uh, it's going to continue to the next iteration and ignore whatever is below it. So um, if it's visited, then continue. But otherwise, um, we're going to do something uh, a little creative with our for loop. So we're going to start out at this index. And as long as our index hasn't been visited, so eventually it'll loop back to our original index, right? So since at every iteration we're setting this index to true, eventually it'll loop back and say, oh, okay, so this vis j is actually true, then we're gonna terminate. Otherwise, we're gonna proceed to the index that we want to be at. So a at j stores the number at the index, next stores the index uh, of the desired order that, it, that a at j wants to go to. So we, we can just advance in the cycle like that. And um, it's going to set everything inside the cycle to true. And we're going to uh, decrease from our answer since we found a cycle. And so at the end, we're just going to output uh, what our answer is. Are there any questions about uh, problem four? OK, uh, if not, um, I'm going to move on to problem five. And I was glad um, some people actually got this problem. Um, 
So I'll read the statement again. So Gordon loves delivering ice cream, and um, he lives in a country in a structure of a tree consisting of n cities numbered from 1 to n, uh, connected by n minus 1 roads. And um, uh, so this is a graph theory problem, right? Um, for those of you that are new to competitive programming, you might not know uh, anything about graph theory, and that's fine because we're we're going to have a, a graph theory unit later in the year, but for those of you coming out of uh, junior stream, you should already know uh, what graph theory is, what DFS is, and you should know, you should know the basic uh, graph traversals um, that you would learn in graph theory uh, junior stream. And obviously for seniors that were here uh, last year, you already know um, how to traverse graphs and everything like that. So, um, I'm, Oh, well, let me just keep reading the statement. So he lives in a country in the structure of a tree consisting of n cities connected by n minus one roads. And he lives in city one. And since he has friends in every city in the country, uh, including city one, so the city he, he's at, he wants to deliver ice cream to all the cities. And it's well known that the ice cream melts when exposed to high temperatures for an extended period of time. And thankfully, uh, Gorn did the research and found out whether each city is either hot or cold. So if the path from city one to his friend's city consists of more than M consecutive hot cities, then ice cream would melt so he won't be delivering any ice cream to them. Help Gordon find out how many friends he can deliver ice cream to. Now, on paper this, um, j with just text, it's kind of hard to understand this problem. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the samples and we're gonna put them, uh, we're gonna try to visualize what's happening. So. Um, uh, let's see, that's, mm. uh, I'm going to pull up a graph editor to help us visualize uh, the samples. So I'll just input the edges uh, in here. Okay, so um, this is what the tree looks like. So Gorn lives in city one, and as per the uh, se second input, or actually this is the first standard input. So there, this is saying there's an edge connecting one and two, edge connecting one and three, two and four, and so on. And so you can see that right here. And so if there's a line between two nodes, that means that there uh, is an edge between them and it can go there. Um, if you don't understand the terms like nodes and edges and trees, don't worry, we'll do a brief review when we actually get to our graph theory unit. Um, and uh, obviously, again, this contest was just to gauge like um, where we're at in terms of uh, knowledge and uh, <coughs> stuff like that and um, so this is our tree structure and so <coughs> what he wants to know is um, given um, that city one is uh, cold city two is cold city three is hot and so everything with one is hot and everything with zero is cold so he wants to know how many um, nodes can he reach that doesn't have a path uh, that whose path from one uh, doesn't consist of more than m consecutive hot nodes. So uh, node node one would be uh, cold, and node two would be cold. So so far this path is zero. And if we try to go to node uh, six, sorry, let me just see. Okay, so uh, it says one here. So the second uh, number here is m, which is the number of city uh, number of consecutive hot cities that the ice cream can travel through before it melts. So if we try to go to six, then we, we can see here that the index six here, uh, it would be a hot node, but that would be fine because one, two, six, since both of these are uh, cold, um, and once we reach a hot node, that would only be one consecutive hot uh, city that we're traveling to, so the ice cream won't melt. But what would happen if we try to travel to five is that we would see, okay, so this is cold, 
uh, this is the path from uh, 1 to 5, right? We go from 1 to 2, 2 to 4, 4 to 5. And so we see that the node 4 is hot and node 5 is also hot. So what would happen is these two are cold, cold, and then this was a hot node. So now you, ha now you have one consecutive hot node. And now you go to the second node, and that, that would give you two consecutive hot nodes. And since 2 is greater than m, which is one here, um, then you're actually not able to reach uh, city five without uh, going on to two consecutive hot nodes. And so that's the basic idea of the problem. So the easiest way to solve this problem is through uh, DFS. So let's define a few things. So let uh, ADJ um, at, at I store the nodes that are adjacent to I. So I made a an array of vectors to store the number of nodes. Again, we're going to talk about adjacency lists and everything like that uh, when we actually reach our graph theory unit. Although, um, if you were in junior last year, you should uh, know how to create adjacency lists and how to perform DFS on graphs. Um, so let hot at i uh, store whether the node i is hot. And um, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to DFS while keeping track of the number of consecutive hot nodes traversed uh, upon reaching the current node. So that would be the hot count variable here. So in our DFS procedure, we're going to store the current node U, the parent node P, or the previous node P, um, because we don't want to go back in our graph. And uh, also we're going to store hot count. and. Um, if the current node is hot, then we're going to increment this. But if it's not hot, then we're just going to set that equal to zero because um, it has to be consecutive nodes that would break our uh, path. So if it's if, if it reaches a cold node at any point, then uh, we can continue uh, adding hot nodes uh, in our hot count, uh, regardless of whether the total amount of um, hot nodes in the path exceeds m. So now after uh, either setting it to zero or incrementing it, if it's greater than M, then we're going to say, OK, uh, there are no nodes in the, in the current subtree that would be able to be reached because uh, the number of consecutive hot nodes already exceeded M. So we're going to return zero. And otherwise, we're just going to go to every child of the current node, and then we're going to um, uh, perform the same DFS on those children and we're going to add one to s signify that um, the current node can be reached. And so in our main function we're going to take an input of N and M. We're going to take an input of um, whether each node is hot or cold and we're going to take an input of the edges and we're going to perform our DFS just like um, we're going to call our DFS function and solve the problem uh, right like that. Are there any questions about problem five? Okay, um, so if, if you don't know graph theory, um, that's totally fine because um, we, we are going to, again, we're going to have a graph theory unit. Um, so so uh, we will do a brief review of graph theory when we actually get there. Um, but yeah, um, if you have any questions about these problems, uh, you can always ask uh, whether it's during this lesson or after the lesson. If you come with a question, you can ask in the Discord, um, etc. And um, what we're going to do now is I want to go over. Actually, uh, I want to do one thing before we take a break, and that's um, we. Uh, I want us to calculate the time complexity of each of the program here. So, does anyone want to tell me the uh, the time complexity of this program, or just take a guess? So uh, Estin said something in the chat. Oh, Evan, that, that would be correct. Because um, we're looping from 1 to n, and n is our input size. And even though we're performing our for loop twice, um, O of 2n would still be O of n because we um, ignore constant factors uh, in big O notation. Good. So uh, who can tell me the time complexity of this program? And this is a little trickier, um, but if you look at the constraints, um, y minus x uh, plus 1 is um, always like greater, less than or equal to 10, or 
I think that's what I said. So what's the, the time complexity of this program, um, even though uh, we're going to make another for loop here, um, this would still have a constant uh, of at most 10. So that, that would also actually have a time complexity of O of n. Uh, actually, I want to ask, um, does anyone know, know the time complexity of this program? Just based on the code? I'll give a hint. So we use the sort function uh, on line 36 here. So that's going to be the thing that impacts our time complexity. Uh, Elder Evan said his answer in the chat. Uh, o of n log n is correct, um, except um, the one thing you have to know is that there is m here. So what we're actually doing is sorting from 0 to m plus m. So if, um, if the total length was n, you would be uh, absolutely correct, except um, um, the total length would actually be n plus m. So what we would write here is um, n plus m log n plus m. And, and that would be our final complexity at the end. Uh, but otherwise, um, if n was the total length of the array, uh, sorting would be the uh, most time-consuming part. So um, what I mean by most time-consuming part is um, the time complexity of this loop. We loop from 0 to n plus n minus 2, so this would have a complexity of n plus n. And this would loop from uh, 0 to n minus 1, so this is an O of m loop. Oh, I don't know why there are two brackets. And this would have a complexity of uh, O of n, right? So if we compare O of m, O of n, O of m plus n, and O of n plus m quantity log n plus m, um, this would obviously uh, have the have the worst complexity among all of these uh, operations. So this is the time complexity that we're going to choose as our worst case complexity. Um, number four, does anyone want to try number four or take a guess as to what the complexity is? Okay, I guess this one's a little bit more difficult, so I'll just give it away. So um, what's happening here is that each node is tra actually traversed at most once. So even though we're looping through all the nodes and then writing another for loop inside of our for loop, um, we have this vis array that prevents us from visiting a node twice. So we know that every, in every single iteration, at least uh, one uh, vis, uh, one of the elements in vis is going to be filled with true. And at the end, we're going to have a vis array full of trues uh, uh, for all, every single node um, in our graph. So what would actually happen is um, for every n, we would only traverse it once. So the whole, the entire complexity of this program would still be O of n. So we have O of n here, O of n here, and then we have uh, O of n, whoops, O of n here again. So the complexity of this whole thing is still O of n. Now, um, a similar idea in our DFS, um, the only thing is that um, uh, we have to take into account of the edges, but luckily it's a tree, so we're going to have n minus 1 edges in total. So w instead of a vis array here, we're keeping track of the parent, so we'll never go back, and each node is traversed at most once, just like how, just like in problem 4. So this would also be complexity of uh, O of n. So we're going to reach this DF, we're going to call this DFS function O of n times. Whoops. And it looks like we're writing a for loop every single call, and the for loop, uh, the maximum amount of times uh, that we call the for loop would be uh, n minus 1 in the case that a node is connected to every other node. But um, what actually happens is that um, the total sum of every single uh, iteration here across all the DFS calls, the total is O of n. So this would actually not, even though this can go up to O of n uh, in each loop, um, in one of the loops, um, overall it's still, across all the DFS calls, 
um, this for loop is still going to run a total of O of n times. So this, the time complexity of this entire program is still going to be O of n. And I believe uh, we would call that uh, amortized um, time complexity. Is that clear? So O of n, um, this would also be O of n. This would be O of uh, quantity n plus m log n plus m. This would be um, O of n, again, uh, multiplied by a constant. Now you see we actually have another loop here. Um, and we're actually looping from 0 to 10 to the power of 6. Now this is still a constant, even though it is a very large constant, which is why um, I put in the dog that even though um, we, we do use time complexity to calculate uh, how slow or fast our program is going to run, uh, constant factors uh, and overhead is still definitely going to be a big part of uh, calculating uh, how fast or slow a program runs, despite the time complexity. And this is uh, O of n, because uh, this is O of n, and uh, this loop is O of n. So this entire program would be an O of n program uh, in terms of time complexity. So. Um, are there any questions, first of all? Uh, o of n squared. Uh, I'm not sure what this is referring to. I think I, I'm reading this message too late. But um, if you do have a question, you can uh, ask at any time. So, uh, hmm. What I actually want to do now is to uh, let's take a two minute break and then we'll come back and do some binary search. Okay, uh, so if we're ready and uh, if there are no more questions, then we'll proceed to the next part of our lesson, which is uh, actually supposed to be the main part, but um, apparently I am not good at estimating. Um, the time it takes to do certain stuff. So today I want to talk about um, time complex. Uh, sorry, I already talked about time complexity, and I want to talk about uh, binary search. So let's consider um, this problem here. If it'll load at some point. So uh, the, the problem, uh, it doesn't actually say what it, what it wants you to do, but, um, oh, it does. So it gives you a list of number, and um, it, it should say sorted in non-decreasing non order. So it's going to be sorted like that, and it wants you to output no if, uh, it's going to give you k queries. So for it's going to give you k numbers. Uh, space separated like that and for each number uh, you're gonna say no if it doesn't exist in this array and you're gonna say yes if it does exist in this array so um, let's try to uh, think about how we could solve this problem so if we were to solve this um, just by using linear search and what I mean by that is say we take 100 and we want to search uh, that's might be a big small I'll zoom in so if we want to take 100 um, and we want to search for 100 in this array what you could do is you can just write a for loop from the beginning to the end of the array and so what that'll do for you is um oh uh, i want to unhighlight that so th it'll take us one for loop for every single query and if it's if we found this element uh, in this array, then we can just say yes, and then if we didn't find it, we can just say no. And so the implementation of that uh, should be pretty simple, so um, I'll just make a new file. Uh, so linear search. Uh, let's make the, since n goes up to 10 to the 5, I'm going to make that our array size. And we need nk and an array that goes up to 10 to the 5. And 
we're going to take an input of n and k, and then uh, we're going to take an input of the array. So let's do a loop from uh, 0 to n minus 1. Or should I do that? Actually, I'll loop from 1 to n and make it one index. So that'll take in uh, our array here. And now uh, I want to answer k queries, uh, so the k numbers they're going to give us. And so what I could do is I can uh, loop from, again, from 1 to k to uh, iterate from 1 to k to uh, perform query, answer k queries. Or something else that um, I like to do is just say while k minus minus. So what will happen here is um, it's going to uh, evaluate k and then it's going to decrease it. And when k reaches 0, it's just going to terminate. So if k was 5, it would go 5 and then 4 and 3 and then 2 and then 1. And then one after that, uh, 1 gets uh, decreased to 0. And so that'll just terminate. And this while loop won't run anymore. And so it'll only run for these iterations. And uh, from 1 to k, there's exactly k numbers, right? So um, you can say while k minus minus just to uh, sh shorthand it and run k queries if you no longer need the number uh, k. So uh, let's, uh, let's take in the number. So we can try to take, in, take the number a. Let's say c and a and ju just take in the number uh, and store it in the variable a. Um, by the way, if you have any questions about uh, whatever code I'm writing, uh, you can also ask. Um, I don't mind explaining it. Uh, and so every time, uh, as we said, we're just going to loop through this array and check if the number is there. So let's just make a boolean flag that says bool found equals false. And we're going to loop through everything in the array. So again, um, as i goes from 1 to n, and I 1 indexed it like this because that's what I did up here. Otherwise, the indices won't match. And we're going to say if array at i is equal to a, which is uh, our number, then we're going to say found equals true. Now, we're, outside of the loop, if we found it, then we're going to uh, print yes. And otherwise, if we didn't find it, we're going to print no. And so hopefully uh, we can, oh, whoops, hopefully we can find whether the element exists in the array like that. Oh, what did I do? Oh, I didn't print out the no. Whoops. Okay, so um, this algorithm worked as we intended, um, but there is one uh, problem. So if we try to calculate the time complexity uh, of this program, uh, does anyone want to try uh, calculating the time complexity of this program here? Uh, o of n squared is the right idea, but um, what's actually happening is we're, we're using this variable k here. So for each iteration in k, um, we're running a for loop to n. So this is going to happen O of k times, right? And then this is going to happen um, O of n times. So you multiply these two, since this is nested inside of that, the final complexity of this entire thing is going to be O of n times k, so, or O of n, uh, kn. And so um, if we try to estimate whether this will pass or not, um, it's pretty easy to do that. So we see that n and k both go up to 10 to the 5. So um, if we try to do um, k, which is 10 to the 5, and times n, which is 10 to the 5, and uh, we, we learned that this will be uh, 10 to the 10. And if we, if we say that, OK, if C++ can run uh, 10 to the 8 operations, then you know 10, 10 to the 10 is definitely great, much greater than 10 to the 8. In fact, it's 100 times bigger. 
So um, uh, it'll take approximately a hundred seconds for our program to ch uh, run in the worst case. So we know that our program is going to get the TLE verdict if we actually um, try to submit it. Actually, I can I can try to submit this program. I think. Okay. Uh, here, I'll submit it. It's just that um, this thing is notoriously slow. Okay, and it's going to tell us that we uh, exceeded time limit if I refresh here. Yeah, so our recent submission made today um, says time limit exceeded on test 7. So that means our solution was too slow to solve this problem. So we want to think of a better algorithm to solve uh, this problem. and. Uh, we want to solve it in a better uh, time complexity than what we had before. So we, what I want to do here is I want to take advantage of the fact that the array is sorted in non-decreasing order. So this is the binary search algorithm that I'm going to demonstrate right now. So say I wanted to find the element uh, 100 in the oh. Okay, that's, that's a good size, I guess. Um, so say I wanted to find the element 100 in this array here. So we're gonna define a, a search space. So first we're gonna search, we wanna search through the entire array like that. So uh, we wanna search for 100 and what we do in the binary search algorithm is we take the middle element. So we have element one and element 10 at the end and let's just take the average of that and get um, the truncated result of uh, 5. Well, it will be 0.5, but we'll just ignore that because um, it doesn't really matter too much whether you choose 5 or 6. So let's go to element 5, which is this element. So 2876. Now, is 100 equal to 2876? No, it isn't. In fact, 2876 is larger than 100. Now, we know since this array is sorted in non-decreasing order, everything to the right of 2876, all, all of this is going to be greater than or equal to 2876, right? And since this uh, 2876 is already strictly larger than 100, then we know that whatever number we have here is going to be uh, greater than 100 as well. So what we can say is that we actually don't need to consider any of the elements in here. Um, we know that none of these are going to be equal to 100 because they're all, strict, all greater than or equal to 2876. So we're going to reduce our search space by half. And we re reduced it by half because we took the middle point uh, in our original interval. So we can erase all of these elements because there's no way they're going to be equal to 100. And now we're going to search through these elements. So again, we have starting index 1, we have index 4, 1 plus 4 uh, over 2. And so this will give us uh, 2.5. But uh, again, it doesn't matter if you choose 2 or 3. Let's just choose 2. Um, so index 2 is 61, and 61 we can see, uh, we can ask if it's equal to 100, it's not, and it's in fact smaller than 100. So what we can say now is anything to the left of 61, so uh, is smaller than 100. And so anything that 61 is greater than or equal to, that thing will definitely not be 100 because it'll be strictly smaller than um, 100 because 61 is uh, greater than or equal to the, whatever's on the left of it. So what we can say is we're going to reduce our search space again. 
and we're going to search instead through these elements. So uh, now we have indices three and four, and so we can average those again. That, that didn't draw for some reason. And so we got uh, 3.5, and it doesn't matter if we pick uh, three or four. So we pick three here because division in C++ automatically truncates for us, and that's fine. And so we go to index three, and we, again, uh, it's the same case as 2876, where 126 is greater than 100. So what we can say, again, is that anything to the right of 126 will not be considered. And so we're left with an empty interval. And what this means is that um, none of the elements in the array satisfy um, the element is equal to 100. So because we're left with an empty interval here. Okay, so now let's try to apply the same algorithm uh, to uh, an element that does actually exist in the array. So let me delete that. So now let's look at 6127, and I'm just going to take you through the process again to uh, really make sure you, you know what's going on. So again, our search interval is this. So uh, again, uh, our starting index is 1. Our ending index is 10. We're going to average that, uh, and that'll give us 5. So let's go to index 5, which is 2876. Now, 2876 uh, is smaller than two, 6127. Oh, I missed a 1. And so anything that's smaller than or equal to 2876, uh, we don't have to consider those. So anything to the left of 2876 uh, won't matter because they're strictly smaller than 6127. Same logic as before. So we can delete all of these. And we reduce our search space by half. So n now we have our starting index of 6 and 10. And so we average 6 and 10. Wow, that's a bad zero and we're going to get 8. So uh, index 8 is this, and we say, okay, 9A126, that's way bigger than 6127, so anything to the right can't be it. We're going to reduce our search space again. Now 6 plus 7. Average that. Let's pick 6. And now we actually see that uh, these numbers are equal, and therefore we're gonna turn it and say yes. Now you might be thinking, okay, this algorithm actually looks very complex. Um, how can it possibly uh, be faster in terms of time complexity? Now, what we actually did here was we only made uh, three iterate, we only went three iterations into this algorithm. So first we pick the middle element here, so that's one, and then we pick this element here, so that's two, and then we pick this element here, so that's three. So actually we only went through three iterations to find this. Now if you were to go through it linearly, at best, if you were to exit early, um, you would still have to make five comparisons. So um, now I wanna ask who can tell me the time complexity of binary searching uh, on this array? So one, uh, just one binary search for e each individual query. What would be the time complexity? Uh, o of log n, and that would be, uh, O of log n would be correct. And uh, can you explain why the complexity of binary search is log n? Right, so divide by two is definitely the right idea. So um, the idea is if you have a number n, then you can only divide um, the number n uh, at most log n times before it becomes one and uh, it terminates, right? 
So every time, in every iteration of the algorithm, we're cutting this uh, search interval by half, and we keep cutting it by half, by half and half again, and eventually it'll just take log n operations um, where n is the size of the array or the size of our uh, search interval. Uh, it'll, it'll just take a log n uh, iterations of this algorithm for it to terminate. So therefore our time complexity of binary search is uh, O of log n. Okay, so now let's try to implement binary search. So what we're instead going to do, instead of this linear search, um, let me get rid of these. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, keep track of the search space by keeping track of the, uh, the smallest index and the highest index of our search space. So you can call that LR, you can call that high, low, um, it doesn't matter too much, or low, high. Um, so I'll just make an integer um, low, so that'll point to the first index. And um, initially our search space is the entire array, so high would be n, since our array is one index. So the starting element is one, and the ending element is n. And so, um, we know that an interval is empty if the low is uh, greater than the high. So it, while the low is smaller than the high index, so for example, if the low index was this and the high index was this, that wouldn't make any sense, right? The search space would have an, uh, a negative size. So, um, but if low and high pointed to the same element, that would still be fine because that means our search space is just this one element here. So while low is uh, less than or equal to high, and we're going to average our low and high, our lowest and highest index indices, uh, just like we did before. So uh, what people usually do is they define an, uh, a variable mid, uh, and they're going to say uh, mid is equal to low plus high over two, and this is how you average two numbers. Now, um, there's another way to do this. Um, so people say, um, if low was somewhere like 2e9 and high was somewhere like 2e9, um, when you add them, I might as well talk about integer overflow now. So um, an integer can only store up to uh, 2 to the power of 31 minus 1, uh, uh, store up to 2 to the power of 31 minus 1. So if you type uh, in max, uh, it'll uh, tell you how, uh, how much an integer, sorry, the largest number that an integer can store. Now, if you try to store anything over that, um, what'll happen is that it'll just wrap around uh, and go to the minimum value of an integer. So, you know, it's the minimum because you can also do int min. And I think that'll be the, th the same thing. And so you can't store integers that are way too, way too large. And if you want to store larger integers, um, you can use long longs to store those and uh, unsigned long longs and there are even bigger integers than that uh, but uh, usually we work with integers and long longs in competitive programming so there um, what a lot of people would say is that this it's easier to overflow with this so instead what the, you can do instead of low plus high over two is you can say mid is equal to low sorry low plus high minus low um, over two. And so what this says is high minus low is the distance between uh, low and high. And if you divide that by two, that's half the distance and you add that to low, um, that would also give you the middle point. I think either way is fine. You just have to be careful with not overflowing. And it's harder to overflow with this because you're subtracting the two elements first instead of adding two numbers that may be very large. Um, but usually we just do low plus high over two. Okay, so now that we have our middle element, we're gonna do our check. So if, um, sorry, the, the, the mid would be the index, right? Because um, the low is the smallest index, high is the biggest index, and the mid would store the middle index that we wanna search for. So if it's equal to the number that we want, then we're gonna say found is equal to true and we can terminate our search, so let's just say break. Now otherwise, 
um, if our element is greater than the number, then anything to the right of this element um, is not going to be useful to us because it's going to be even greater than this. So what we can do is we can limit our search space just like I showed before and say that high is equal to mid minus one. So now it's not going to check uh, anything that's between mid and high. Well, that was between mid and high because those numbers are, are never going to be equal to A. Now, otherwise, we're actually only left with one um, option, but I'm just going to type out the condition anyway. So if it's smaller than the number, then anything to the left is not useful. So we're going to adjust low to be equal to mid plus one. And so that would be our binary search implementation. And let's just hope I didn't mess anything up. OK, and uh, this would, so let's recalculate the time complexity of our program. So this binary search algorithm would be, um, or I can write it in here, I guess. Whoops. This would be O of log n. This would be O of k. Now, so the total time complexity would be O of uh, k times log n. And now, um, if we go look at the constraints again, um, they go up to 10 to the 5, right? So um, 10 to the 5 times um, the log, uh, log 2 of 10 to the 5. Now, um, and time complexity, we don't really put the base because um, it doesn't matter too much in terms of the growth rate. Um, uh, but in calculations, you can. So log 2 of 10 to the 5. So we can see that it's not going to be much greater because um, so you take the 5 out in front by logarithm rules. So you can see it's just going to be a, a slight constant uh, times 10 to the 5 which is going to pass if C++ can run 10 to the 8. Whoops. 10 to the 8. OK, so you know 10 to the 8, um, that's, this is going to fit into 10 to the 8 pretty easily. So we can predict that our algorithm will probably pa pass. OK, uh, let's try to submit this. Are there any questions? Yeah, um, so uh, do you guys have any questions about binary search? So this is the most basic version uh, of binary search, which is finding, uh, checking whether an element exists in a sorting, sorted array. And um, yeah, you kind of have to understand this if we were to go into uh, some more complex uh, usages of binary search. So. Um, if you don't understand anything uh, in this piece of code, uh, you should definitely ask. Oh, this is taking a long time. Okay, so as you can see, our, t uh, our solution got accepted and it only took 77 milliseconds. So uh, we had a very fast solution to the problem. And uh, you, you can see how t um, l lowering our time complexity really made our pr program run much faster than it would have um, if we use linear search, which uh, you can see that our linear search submission uh, uh, time limit exceeded. So um, it is 554. I had a lot m um, more planned, but I, it looks like we're not going to get there today. Um, so I think this would be a, a good place to end. Uh, so if you guys have any questions about binary search, uh, you can ask. And if you come up with a question later, you can always ask in the Discord. And uh, yeah, I think that'll be it for today. Um, have a good day. And thank you for coming.